Okay, so thank you so much for coming on this cold Melbourne night, and I acknowledge everybody here. Thank you, Dave, for those words. Is, can now, is the lighting right, or is that okay? We'll talk pretty much, you, because the key image for this evening is behind us, and it's emerging. It wasn't here a short time ago, and every time we come in here, it's progressed further. Now, when we were were at Randwick training to doing the, the pre-troop deployment to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, we attended uh, a week of basically PowerPoints um, and we were absolutely staggered by the way the military deal with PowerPoints. They're on time <laughs> and they don't go over time. You see? And if you work in the academic world as I do, I'm not used to that. <laughs> So a bit of didactics for you, and I don't expect you to read that, but it's just here to reassure you. Um, and on the top left is a tiny thumbnail of the great painting of Men and Gate that um, in the town of Ypres up in Belgium, at one end of that marvellous veterans trail. And in 1928, the Australian painter, Will Longstaff, celebrated work Men and Gate toured Australia to astonishing scenes of public residence. And it was immediate, immediately purchased and donated to the emergent Australian War Memorial. And it depicts his fantasy of the Men, of the Men and Gate Memorial. And it arose from a vision that he said he had at night when he walked out along the Menon Road and he said he saw the ghosts of the dead marching in endless lines. Now, that was a point of departure for us in arriving at our vision of what we wanted to do here. And that is that Menengate did not conform to traditional expectations of war art. It didn't depict martial action didn't depict heroism, and it didn't portray heroes. But it's enormously powerful, and it's become an absolutely iconic image that both the general public and soldiers and their families see when they go to the Australian War Memorial. And we're intensely aware of the in intense reverence with which families of soldiers and, this, and the military themselves the attachment that they have to the War Memorial in Canberra and to images that are artistic, like that great Sir John Longstaff painting. So, so this image will stand. Is that working? No? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this image will stand in, I think, pretty much for our tour in 2007. We were official artists for the Australian War Memorial in Iraq and Afghanistan. This image here is an image that I took, and most of our work, uh, all of our work is collaborative, but I know for a fact that I took that particular image because Charles wasn't there. Um, and I was sitting in the jump seat behind the pilot and co-pilot in a Chinook helicopter flying low and fast um, from Kandahar Airport to Helmand Province, um, a supply mission um, that touched down for a few seconds and took off again. It was quite a hair-raising experience. Um, this experience as official artists was quite important to us in thinking about how um, one could construct a memorial to war. Um, so this particular trip was about the action of actually being in a war zone and that six weeks felt like a very, very long time. And you realise when you've been in a war zone, even as a civilian, um, that it's an experience that happily none of us will normally expect to experience in our lifetimes and it's actually something quite beyond words. So that was quite a profound and moving experience. The War Memorial um, Commission resulted in a year's work back in the studios afterwards, sifting through thousands and thousands of images um, and reducing them to uh, a body of work that, that commemorated the, um, the weird um, difficulty of political agency in a war zone. And we actually had incredible responses from um, serving troops that we met after they returned, um, seeing those images and they felt that we'd really somehow conveyed something in a humble way of their... You can't hear me? Okay. Uh, is that better? Yeah? 
Um, yes, yeah, so, and then this is moving um, back to um, the Australian landscape after our experience in a war zone. This is a work that's in the Art Gallery of New South Wales, a painting of um, deep rock over the Yarra, and you can see also there's subtle political elements in there to do with refugees and global warming and the war zones. So they're all sort of floating in this um, upside down world. Because it takes years to artistically integrate an experience like that. And it's not even something that you deliberate, you, if you realised what you were letting yourself in for in terms of the mental and psychic disruption to your work as an artist, you might not accept a commission like that. And I think, of course, soldiers have an, and military have an even, um, like an infinitely greater response because, and we, and incidentally, one of the things that absolutely surprised us was the uh, enormous, great, um, deep respect we feel now. We felt immediately coming in those war zones for Austra the Australian military, for the people there, the young men and women, by and large, shockingly young often, um, who working with absolutely stupendous professionalism in extraordinarily difficult conditions. It's like going to the moon. And basically something like 90% of the people we were involved with were involved in, in taking care of the 10% who end up in those zones. So this was one of the first attempts of ours to integrate that experience with our, our artistic work. And this was the next phase, and this is a, a very large painting. For us, a very large painting. It's about two metres by three and a half metres, and it's called Scatter Santa Cruz, because at this point, we, with the help of the Australian Research Council, a very generous three-year grant from them, we worked with uh, Professor John Catapan, a close friend of ours, who'd been an Australian official war artist in Timor-Leste, in, on a peacekeeping mission after things had begun to quieten down, about two years after that. After us, in 2009, he was deployed there. We, we toured around uh, sites in Vietnam where Australians had served in Timor Leste, basically taking an enormous number of photographs and sketching and drawing. And this is a very large painting of the cemetery in Santa Cruz the key site of the massacre of the, by the Indonesian troops of the Timor-Leste students that really, tri years later, set the course for the vote for independence that then triggered the enormously far-reaching, profound Australian intervention in Timor-Leste on behalf of of many nations. So this is a, this is the cemetery, and that's my shadow. I know I took that photograph um, over the cemetery there. And we worked for about four or five years with John on a major body of work uh, in which we sought to interpret the significance of Australia's involvement in conflicts from Vietnam to now. And, and you can see that this particular project is more to do with the aftermath of war than the war itself. It uh, basically appears as a series of phantoms. You've got the uh, sort of a night scene in the south of Iraq of um, tents and troops under, um, sort of lighting at night, getting ready for a night mission. But then you've got the hope of the young um, Timorese uh, in the foreground down below. Uh, and so it's sort of like a map of ghosts and aftermath. Um, and much more, I have to say, interesting to be visiting those sites, say in Vietnam or Timor-Leste, after the conflict than to actually be in the war zone. But having been in a war zone, understanding the traces and, and seeing the way things disappear after a war, which is so comforting. Because one of the things, and this is a big painting called League of Birds, uh, which is a, an amalgam, it's an atlas. And if I was to ask you to think of our work today, uh, if you were to ask me what would be one word to understand our work as contemporary artists, because we are contemporary artists. We were really the first, inverted commas, contemporary artists 
that the War Memorial Commission, they traditionally commissioned fairly, not conservative, but very good artists who worked in a, in a very recognisable, figurative way. And they would go out and sketch and draw. And all of this was, of course, reactivated uh, in 96 because the, the official war artist scheme really fell into abeyance after Vietnam. And it was only reactivated with Timor Leste. And if you were to ask me how contemporary, how we as contemporary artists who do not work with one medium, who work across media, photography, painting, um, digital to some degree, if you were asked to us, give me one word to describe what we do that differentiates us from, say, a more traditional mode of working, that one word would be an atlas. We make maps, we make mind maps. And those mind maps are an amalgam of collages where you put together different diverse images and when they're put together they rub up against each other and they create friction and a charge and they have energy. So you can see from the images we're showing you that um, this archival aspect also appears in the tapestry design that we're about to talk about. So the sense of floating fragments, images from other worlds, from, from other times. And this is what informed our original design of the tapestry. We thought a lot about a memorial. We know that the initial impulse is that you would think of images of, um, of that battlefield. And we were thinking, well, what would we bring to a memorial centre for Australians in France? And we realised that actually for the air of contemplation that we wanted to encourage, the air of reflection um, on that cataclysmic event that happened in the Somme so long ago, what we needed was to bring something from that other side of the world. So if Australians or whatever nationalities are visiting um, Villers-Bretonneux, they would see something of the other land that the Australian troops brought so long ago to the Somme. So they're looking not at the French, the incredibly gently undulating, beautiful French um, countryside full of fields and poppies and um, that classic picturesque French landscape. They're actually looking at an Australian forest and it's, it's buried under the ground behind the Lutchens Tower. So it's that little piece of Australia. So people will go in there and see an Australian forest and then they'll see fragments of uh, people seeing off boats, ships, going to the other side of the world, unimaginable distances in those days. And they will get the sense of the strangeness of the journey and of that particular place that those soldiers came um, from to Villa Bretonneau, so far from their homes and for so long as well they were cut off from their families, those that were lucky enough to return. So that's really what our design is about. So you see Australians in the Australian landscape, but you also see them farewelling the, the ships. And we're also, in the terms of the pathway that leads through the forest and up into the mist and the sunlight, it's actually also that reverse journey. So it's that golden thread that would lead those survivors back to Australia as well. So it's a sense of journeying out and the, the hopeful vision of some of them coming back, even though, as we know from personal stories, um, the damage was immense. And Charles might talk to that a bit. Because, so this is the final design. You're looking at the final design. And we're going to move backwards to, the, from the, to our second, our initial vision and then the vision after that. And this is the final one. So really, we were thinking about arrival, because when the soldiers arrived, when my grandfather arrived uh, at the front, because my grandfather was gassed at Passchendaele and died a slow death for another 10 years. Um, and when they arrived, and he, he sent letters back to my grandmother, they were intensely aware of how it, where they were coming from. And it took them a long time to arrive. It still does. It takes you a long time to arrive. It's like going to the moon. And as you arrive, you bring with you where you came from. And gradually things fade away. And what stays with you as you get close to something like that 
it's a bit like dying, I suppose, is your childhood. And your childhood, you remember things like sunlight, you remember leaves, you remember experiences that are precious to you. And I think that's what those young men must have felt as they moved. Because many, many, many soldiers come from either soldier families or from country areas, from regional Australia. So they were coming from these places of enormous beauty and they were arriving and that arrival was slow. That's the... The overall image is really one of dawn light in winter illuminating a pathway. And that overall vision of dawn light is punctuated by scenes of departure of ships. And I should also observe that the interesting thing, as, as this caption says, is that this is not entirely a monochromatic image. It's an image taken around dawn on a very sort of cold, misty dawn, and the sun is just starting to burn the mist off. So it actually makes the forest look like a sepia-toned photograph, but it's actually a full-colour image, so it's that paradox. And we're always interested in the idea of trompe l'oeil, the idea of tricking the eye, and we do that through painting and we do that through photography. So we thought that this almost monochrome but not quite image had that resonance of a, of a historical image, but also of a contemporary image. And we're quite interested in the slippage between colour and monochrome. And if you get up to the tapestry after the talk, you'll see that actually the, the weavers have quite cleverly used a lot of colour to get that monochrome effect. And if you see it from a distance, it's going to look quite monochrome. So we're quite interested in that whole um, trick of the eye. But we also think, and um, we would assert, that I don't think any Australian walking into that beautiful uh, light-filled space and seeing the tapestry would ever mistake these shapes for European trees. I'm positive that every Australian who sees these will just recognise instantly that these are eucalypts. I'm absolutely certain of that. And as we were travelling, because we've recently returned from the Somme, but travelling around Europe, whenever we saw a eucalyptus tree, uh, we have this... this <laughs> wonderful reaction of familiarity and, and love for the eucalypt. It's something that's so distinctive and yet subtle. So this is what it will look like and there are photographs, photographic montages um, scattered around the room explaining that that you can look at. It's a big space, the, the St John Murray Centre. It's, it's quite grand but humble at the same time. That's a, a really interesting juxtaposition because it's quite simple, it's quite austere and, you walk, and one walks into a large space, an entry area that is a space of contemplation before you go in and see the multimedia. It's quite divorced, the, the zones and our work really is obviously going to stand pretty much by itself. But this is the near to final zone uh, image and here we had a figure walking back into the landscape more colour, male figure walking off. We thought it was a little bit sentimental when we thought about it. We started off with an image that was basically taken from a very large painting of ours um, called Ghost Fleet. And we thought this was what we would do. And it's basically an image of Bush, still pretty monochromatic, pretty much browns and greys. But again, we, we thought, no, 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 no. Tapestry has a unique ability to translate photography in a way that will give people a bit of a shock that isn't quite what you would expect. So the, the centre really wants a reverential response as you enter. The brief says that the tapestry is a mediating element between the interpretive and the reflective functions. That's not a bad idea of the difference between an informative, relic-driven, narrative-driven museum and a memorial like the Australian War Memorial is. So it's, it's a difficult task, it's a complex task. And this is where, where this will be. This is the site in Villa Bretonneur, looking outward from the great Lutchens Towers towards the fields, towards Amiens. You're looking at what the Germans saw as they looked, as they moved forward, you're seeing pretty much as far as they got, just a little bit further. 
And you can also see from this image, hopefully, the importance that the actual tombstones have and the names that appear on walls in other parts of the memorial. And certainly the interpretive centre is designed in such a way that it will enhance that experience without replacing the reflection of just gazing at the, at the tombstones and seeing people that were that died at the age of 25 or, 21. You know, or 21 and all, um, I mean, they're mainly Australians there, but, um, but the scale of um, death across the song was, is quite awesome. And I think the interpretive centre will certainly underscore that without distracting from that contemplation. Also, the site at Villa Bretonneau is actually very powerful. A couple of you in this audience may have been there. It's actually quite an extraordinarily powerful site. It's, it's on a hill, you walk up, and it's, it's an extremely powerful choreographic experience walking up. The, the, it was designed in, in the 20s by the great British architect Edmund Lutyens. It's a great, great, great um, work. And the centre is basically underneath that as you go across the top of the hill. Another scene of that. And here is the centre under construction, the fit-out stage. It's big. It's... Um, divided quite strongly into austere areas and here it's full of stuff. And and I should note, I mean you can look at the photographs over there but what is interesting is you walk up to the Lutchens Tower which is quite a presence and you can see from the tower across to uh, Amiens and Ville Bretonneur and Le Amel so you can see all of the, I think you can even see Chepval from the tower and then after that you walk down at it's not a tunnel exactly, it's enclosed but with an open roof into the centre. So you're walking under the ground. And this centre, is, um, um, as Dave was saying before, is, has the, the roof of it is grass that is made of these <coughs> grass seeds uh, collected from the meadow around. So it will match exactly Lutchen's landscaping. Originally that was meant to be, uh, at one point, Australian wildflowers. So, and we didn't know that when we came up with our design. So we were quite thrilled when um, we presented it and discovered that actually the forest under the ground would have this, a similar resonance to the Australian wildflowers above, given that that ended up not being possible. So we're very pleased about that. The context is, is one of... And for Australians, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine the density of memorials and cemeteries in that area of France, the suffering that took place, the scale of the death. And it's something that I, the people who live there live with and amongst, and it's still extremely present. Uh, this is the great memorial for the British and French at Tiepval. And I'm standing, as I took this panoramic photograph, uh, back to, to my right is the beautiful new memorial at Tiepval that also features art. It's not always the case that these uh, memorials feature art. They often simply feature relics or they feature educational didactic texts and photographs and texts. And one thing that Australia has been very interesting in its approach with has been we've taken from, from 1916 on, art has been really central to telling our national story in a way that's not always as true for other nations. This is very, very much the case for Australia, that artists have been very present and the art has been extremely significant. Sir Arthur Streeton's works are amongst the very best that he ever did. I mean, for many years they were under a cloud. People thought that he really hadn't done anything as great as his works in the 1890s. But we, we can now see that the works he did uh, in, on the Western Front were amongst his most important works. George Lambert's great Gallipoli works are amongst the very greatest works that he ever painted. So Australian art really has been very important in telling the national story. And this is um, the men in Gate uh, in Ypres and uh, amazingly and, and quite movingly um, they play the last post every evening there at 8pm. Um, 
uh, no matter what the weather, no matter what the crowd is. Because it was summer, there was quite a, a group of people there. But basically, they take the, um, the memorialisation of La Grande Guerre, as, as they would call it, the war to end all wars, people thought at the time. Um, they take that very seriously, and they do that in a humble and moving way. Um, <clears throat> this trip through the Somme was actually quite an intense, uh, profound experience. This is the Canadian uh, memorial at Vimy, which is huge. It's actually, as you can see, quite hard to encompass in a photograph. It's very, very tall. And there's a new um, visitor's centre at Vimy as well that has just opened. So we saw the need for the visitor centre at Villa Bretonneur because Vimy, the Canadians, have done a beautiful memorial there um, with not many objects, but with... Um, some castings of graffiti in the tunnels there. And also the other beautiful thing about the Vimy Memorial, um, the actual visitor centre, is that they have young Canadian, um, I think they were students actually, who come to, they stay in Aha um, for say three months over summer, or I think they do it in shifts. And they are uh, incredibly well informed about the whole Somme region and the memorial and about the Canadian involvement in the Somme. And they greet you either at this memorial or in the visitor centre and they talk to you about the experience of that place. And I thought that was an incredibly um, hopeful thing to have young Canadians um, as, as the guides, as the conduits to welcome you at this place. That was a, a very moving experience. Here, and we'll, we'll finish with this image, um, I think this is the last one, and there'll be time for you to ask us any questions you want, or if they're technical, we will defer completely to the wisdom of the marvellous waivers we've been waivers. working with. Um, and we'll defer very rapidly if, you, if that happens. Um, it's, as an artist, you don't expect to have experiences that almost throw you off track in your life. And as uh, another artist from another nationality said to us about being involved with war and war art, once you touch this theme, you almost can't leave it. Uh, it takes you and grabs you and takes you with it. This is the beautiful, small, quite humble, immaculately kept memorial to the Indian soldiers on halfway between Villa Bretonneau and Ypres. Tens and tens and tens of thousands of Indian soldiers served on the Western Front as well, Moroccans and, as well. And labourers. And yeah. labourers. And it's one of the things for us as Australians that's, that's very rich because our understanding of the tapestry of history changes and that is that this war was a global war. It was not just a European war. And there was an empire. And for better or worse, people from all across the empire, Australia, Canada, South Africa, India, served together. My father told me, because he served in World War II, that in New Guinea, as they fought their way up, he preferred, because the Australian food was so rotten, he preferred to go and eat with the Indians who were there um, as well. So he'd slip away from the Australian quarters and slip across gently towards the Indians. So this, this multinational identity, that we're quite used to this, the multiculturalism of Australia, that was also the experience of those soldiers. And that's something that that tapestry, that re-understanding of the richness of historical tapestry the tapestry that makes up history is something that we feel very strongly about. And so the medium of tapestry to us seems incredibly appropriate as the artistic medium chosen to be inserted into Villa Bretonne. That's it for us talking, doing a solo presentation. We welcome your questions. Thank you. <laughs>